The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter said in reply, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly ordered his disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. The Gospel of the Lord. There's a great quip attributed to Eleanor Roosevelt that goes something like this. You wouldn't worry so much about what other people think of you if you knew how little they did. When I become overconcerned about the impression I leave, I take comfort in these words. They, you, care a lot less than I sometimes imagine. Oh, it doesn't exclude excuse rudeness or cavalier behavior. It just means I need to have a healthy, balanced self-awareness in order to just be me and in order to relate well to you and the world around me. So let me ask you, was it arrogant and self-centered for Jesus to ask his questions? Who do they think I am? Who do you think I am? Or does it reflect healthy self-awareness? I think the latter. I learned a little bit about self-awareness from Kate McCormick and Mary Lynn Pierce this last week at the annual Backyard Retreat. On a bad self-awareness day, we become fixated on why. We spend the day asking why questions. Why does this always happen to me? Why am I left out? Why can't they see I'm struggling? On a bad day, we tend to whine our way through with why questions. Whereas on a good self-awareness day, we're more likely to focus on what? What must I do so this doesn't happen to me again? What can I say to help them see my struggles? What's going on here over which I have no control? On a good day, we have enough perspective and self-esteem to ask what questions. And then, this is just my opinion, what questions will lead us to healthy who questions? Like, who can I turn to for help? Who do I know who can really understand my struggle? Who do I want to emulate? Who do I think I am? Who do others think I am? Who do you think I am? While why questions give us only a moment of cathartic commiseration, we feel better for just a moment through our whining. These who questions have lasting power when asked with honesty and sincerity. In our gospel today, Jesus is not asking why. 
He's not asking what. He's asking who. And in doing so, I believe he is calling his disciples and us into a higher level of self-awareness. And it's only there, it's only at that higher level of self-awareness that we can fully and appropriately be aware of others and their needs and respond to them. Jesus is calling us to the who questions. Now, let's consider Peter's response. You know, I don't think truer words have ever been uttered than Jesus' response to Peter when he said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. I say this because given what we know about Peter, I don't think he had a clue about his profession of faith before the words came tumbling out of his mouth. Peter is a classic extrovert. You know that some people are thinkers while others are talkers. Talkers will tell you just what's on their minds while thinkers will dwell. Talkers don't care how it comes out as long as it gets out. While thinkers need to get it out, put it all down in an orderly, logical sequence, and that takes time. And inevitably means a lot of stuff never gets out. Me? I'm a thinker, not a talker. Oh, I function well in, in our social settings and in teaching, speaking situations. But when it's important, when the message has to be just right, I have to go into the deep recesses of my cave, to darkness and quiet, to find just the right words. And by, and by the time I do that, it's almost always too late, and someone else has found adequate words. Not the best ones, but adequate words. And the world has moved on to the next problem. Happens to me all the time. Peter, though, didn't even know it was in his brain until it came out of his mouth. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he nailed it. This time. Next week, next week's gospel, well, his words get him into trouble. And when I hear this, I wonder, well, what about James or Nathaniel or any of the other disciples? Some of them were surely introverts, and, and I picture them still thinking and formulating their response to Jesus' deep and insightful question. They want to get it right. They want to demonstrate true wisdom, and they certainly want to avoid sounding foolish. In the meantime, Peter dives in, utters inspired words, and, <laughs> and that earns him keys to the kingdom. Well, and a boatload of responsibility. What's more important here is for us to see how Peter and all the disciples, and by extension us, are being called, beckoned, into leadership. Our first reading from Isaiah sets the stage. Isaiah recounts a, a regime change in the Israelite monarchy. The master of the palace, I think the king's prime minister, loses his position because of selfish and self-centered leadership to, replace, to be replaced by Eliakim, chosen by God for the task. And his duty is to be, quote, father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. In other words, his task is one of service to God's people and to serve in the manner in which a parent would provide for his family. 
Likewise, Peter is called into leadership, just like Eliakim, but partly because he's not afraid to proclaim his faith in Christ right out loud for all to hear. Now, there are other things in, in the Gospels where Peter proclaims right out loud things that he does, doesn't get right, not the least of which are his three adamant denials. But that's for another time. Peter is at least willing to be self-defined. A good leader, whether extrovert or introvert, is self-defined knows where he stands, and has the courage to proclaim that stance. Well, you may be sitting there thinking, uh, I'm not a leader, never have been, never will. Really? At the very least, you are a leader of one. You. And Jesus beckons you to lead a life that proclaims your faith, self-definition, that focuses more on what and who rather than why, self-awareness, and engage in your relationships like a parent, like a father or a mother or a family member. Love. In this way, your leadership will certainly extend well beyond just you. And whether you see yourself as a leader or not, as we enter into this election season, I think we need to apply the same criteria to the leaders we choose. Self-defined, focused on what and who, not why, in other words, a good, clear self-awareness, and operate out of genuine, familial, family-type love for others. Use these filters as you do your ballot research. See who emerges as genuine leaders.